next meeting in May is going to be at the library. It's going to be cake and coffee. Okay? Um, Steve is going to pass around some programs. It's on the bottom. It's May 5th. It's down on the bottom here where it is. So is now we have the Cosma sisters here from Little Utica. Is it Pickleville or Picketville? Oh, Picketville. Okay. All right. I just I saw this postcard and I thought that's got to be the same place because it's a big pickle and I thought it's it, I don't know. I just get very confused about these things, so you can tell this is this is how the evening is going to go tonight. All right. I'm just not on my game. So we do have a trivia contest. I'm going to pass these out. Now, to force audience participation and to get, your know your get to know your neighbor, I think there are like 50 people here. I only printed about 25, so you're going to have to partner up. So I highly recommend getting with somebody who knows Pickaville or the Little Utica area because you increase your odds of winning. And so the Cosmo Sisters would be number one. So you guys split up and help. Well, you're the president. You've got to decide that. I know. I made it up on the way. You can see we plan these things out in advance. So I was thinking like, so we'll fill, these, we'll fill these out and then turn them in at the end and then we'll draw from among all the winning entries because I'm sure you're going to get them all right. And then year's mem membership for somebody? Is, it, is that okay? <laughs> okay, yeah, two people, year's membership. So this is the last man to leave Pickaville. You're, you're, I stand corrected. Um, this is the third in a series of four. We did something called Something's Up on Downer Street about spiritualism in Baldwinsville. Uh, and then the Baldwin Home for Indigent Gentlewomen about a uh, Baldwin heir who tried to help out the community and it didn't go so well for her. How many of you came to the last one or two of these so you know the drill? Tonight's going to be a little bit different because instead of being a biography about a person, it's going to be more of a travelogue about a place. So a lot of pictures and a lot of sites and things like that. So chime in anytime you want, especially if you know something about the area. Um, and then on May 5th, as Barb said, we're going to do Carpe Diem. That's kind of a misleading title, although maybe it's not. It's about the history of carp fishing um, and the carp in the Seneca River. It was never, they're not native and it was never intentional that they be here. So um, it's kind of an interesting story. It'll be in the community room at the public library. Annual meeting at 6.30, 7 p.m. presentation, and even better refreshments than we have here, which is hard to, hard to beat, but they will be. So I want to, um, I did this the last two times, and I don't want to embarrass Bonnie. Sue's not here, but I want to thank our local historians, past and present. We've talked about Leslie Voorhees and Pearl Palmer and Tony Christopher and George Hawley, but both Bonnie and Sue have made tremendous contributions to the community, and I think they deserve a round of applause. Because if it weren't for Bonnie, we wouldn't know about the Great Pine War of... <laughs> Did I mention what? Lynn, Lynn. Oh, Lynn Pinto's here from the uh, town of Van Buren, town historian. Thank you for being here. Sorry about that. I mean, over. And, not to put you on the spot, but Lynn uh, Precourt, uh, right? Yes, you. Not a historian, but the first newspaper article I wrote in my series that led to some of these presentations, she helped me out with. So you can either praise her or curse her, depending on how tonight goes. <laughs> Lynn, what were you thinking? Don't answer his questions next time. Whatever. So it's time to play Picketville Trivia. Do you each have your little sheet and your partners? I'm just going to read these real quick. What's the original name of the lake with the park and the town of Lysander? There's only really one lake. I'm sorry? Well, who... who who thinks it's Mud Lake? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who thinks it's Beaver Lake? Bill Weston is the only hand up. Could be good or it could be very bad. Uh, who thinks it's something other than Beaver Lake or Mud Lake? Good. Okay. Well, I'm not going to tell you. You'll find out later. Um, then there's the outlet that flows out of Beaver Lake, Mud Lake, other lake name. Uh, all the way to Ox Creek. 
okay, up in town of Granby um, in Oswego County. There's a name for that, too. Does anybody know what that is? Well, we, we don't need to get into that right now. There, there were three lost villages that were um, identified in a book in the town of Lysander. Um, one is Picketville. There are three others. So if you have pen or pencil, you're going to want to document these things. Otherwise, you won't get a free membership, which is worth how much? Hundreds of dollars. Um, and we'll make sure that you have reserved parking and a great seat. Um, there was a state assemblyman who tried to clear the outlet of all the obstructions, which was not popular among the people who had sawmills on the outlet. So you'll have to ha answer that one. There was a guy who was the tall pine of Lysander and his granddaughter. <laughs> yeah, not Steve Rainus. It was a different guy. But <laughs> Steve is tall, but he's not from Lysander. Uh, what two foods did Americans try for the first time at the Centennial Exhibition in 1876? More important, what the heck does that have to do with Picketville? We'll find out. Uh, what was the mascot of the 1898 class at the Jacksonville Rural School? If, you weren't, if you didn't go to school in 1898 at Jacksonville, you might want to look into that one, too. And then, of course, what was the name of the last man to leave Picketville? You said there's somebody already. Guessed it. Guessed it. And I know there are at least two ladies in here who know it well. Uh, <laughs> what year did the last man leave and the last house disappear? Uh, what year did Tony Christopher go back and visit the ruins at Picketville? And a bonus question, somebody visited later on and discovered uh, a treasure trove of household artifacts. And there are a few people in the audience, I think probably five or six, they're gonna recognize this person. So those are the trivia questions. Any questions about the trivia questions? Okay. We are in a no gambling area, Village of Baldwin, so there's no wagering, no gambling of any kind. So just, um, so we'll can you cheat? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I make this stuff up anyway. Uh, so we're going to talk about three things. As I said, as we've done these programs before, I typically try to come up with three questions that I try to answer, sometimes more successfully than others. And the first one's, where, where the heck was this place, right? Has anybody heard of Picketville before this presentation came up? Raise your hand if you'd heard of it. Okay. Last, last meeting, you told us about it. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't counting on that. <laughs> Somebody who actually paid attention. Um, and then if you think you know where it is or was, raise your hand. Ah, fewer people. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to find out. What? Yeah. If you don't care, you're just here for the snacks, raise your hand. That's okay, too. Uh, what was Picketville? How did it get here? And uh, when did it disappear? So we'll talk about all these things and more. So by 1933, it was already a forgotten village. So here we are, what, uh, some 75 years later or so. Um, there was a guy named um, T. Elmer Bogardus. Um, the Bogardus family actually goes back to Jacksonville, some of the earliest settlers in the area. He was a descendant. He went on to become pretty prominent in Onondaga County politics and also wrote uh, a lot about local history. And he wrote an art, a series of articles with a lady named Elizabeth Pike in 1933 to 34 called The Forgotten Villages of Onondaga County. And it went around and, and identified some of these little hamlets that, as you can imagine, even by the 30s, you know, 100 years ago, we've talked about this a lot, how interesting it must have been to live around here 150 to 200 years ago, because these little hamlets were thriving communities. They had churches, they had grange halls, they had schools, they had stores, they had blacksmiths, they had... Um, Sawyers, they had uh, a lot of things going on and they were self-sustaining little communities that were thriving and they were communities in every true sense of the word and that neighbors really took care of each other and watched out for each other. But they started to disappear because uh, a couple of things, a lot of people left the farms and so these little centers of agriculture uh, became less relevant and also um, moved to the cities and then also populations started to, started to um, plateau and so they weren't growing at all. As people migrated to the cities, there was no one there to replace them. Interestingly enough, Dick Case, how many have heard of Dick? He was a great writer uh, for the Syracuse Post Standard, and I think Herald Journal before that, too. Wonderful guy and a great author. Um, did a lot of local interest stories. Actually went out and covered the Jacksonville Grange probably 40, 50 years ago for a story that was phenomenal. Anyway, he wrote this book, um, which he took Elmer, if I can call him that, and Elizabeth's stories and put them into book form called The Forgotten Villages of Onondaga County. Highly recommend it. It's in the Baldwin Public Library 
And if you think local history doesn't pay, guess what the going rate for this out of print book is right now on Amazon.com? I just checked. It's not a trivia question. I should have made it one. $242 for this little picnic. So guess which book I'm not going to pass around the audience. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> Sign it out of the library and we'll hope we get it back. Right, Bonnie? Um, okay, so, so Dick took these stories, put them into a book, and of course one of the, st one of the places in there was Pickettville, uh, along with a couple of others. Um, and then Tony Christopher, we've talked about all the contributions he's made, former town of Van Buren historian, wrote um, prodigiously and voraciously about life in the 1800s, early 1900s, what it must have been like. And think about poor Tony. You know, it's pretty easy today. If, you, if you're on Ancestry.com, how many are? Okay. And then there's sites like FultonHistory.com where you can check articles from the past. Tony had to go in and slog it out through the archives at the Messenger um, and pour through old articles and piece together facts and talk to people. And it was really, really difficult. But he he put together this story in 1969 where he re revisited this forgotten village of Picketville, actually went there, talked to locals, took photographs, and tried to piece together a little bit more information than Elmer and Elizabeth and Dick were able to put together. Um, and he also wrote another article, which was even better, about the seven sawmills that were on the outlet between the unnamed lake on the unnamed creek that led to Ox Creek. So this has got to be audience participation. I'm, I'm expecting a lot of like questions and comments, especially from the Cosma girls. So, um, 40 years later, thanks to Lynn, I started writing a column in the Messenger about local history, and I picked up on the Picketville story, and I thought this is kind of interesting. Let's revisit it some 40 years later and see what else we can find out. And so I interviewed some folks. Unfortunately, most of them have passed by now, like a lot of the stories that I did. And my approach to the story wasn't just the place, but also there was a guy that lived there till the very end, and he was the last one to leave, and he was very eccentric. Um, and, you know, difficult story, I think, in many ways, because he was, um, you know, he was stuck in a time, I think, that really um, people couldn't survive in any longer. And so... It's a story about him and a story about Picketville and, and how hard it was to keep that community going. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So where was Picketville, really? We've talked about this, and people have said they're not sure where it is. If you can decipher my maps, I'm kind of a map nut. But this is a map from um, Dick Case's book, and all the little red, red numbers identify these lost villages throughout Onondaga County. Again, these are all little hamlets that just kind of disappeared. You know, the church closed, the school closed, the Grange Hall closed, the stores closed, whatever. And there were a handful of people still living there, but they were really gone. Now, my only bone of contention with the case, great author, not a great cartographer. Um, because, and the girls that went to Horton Town will, will, will uh, bear me out here, but he's got Picketville right here. Picketville is actually right there on the east side of East Mud Lake Road, north of Church Road. He's got it down here somewhere near the intersection of Church and 48. He's got Horton Town in the middle of the Three Rivers Wildlife Management Area. No. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's wrong. So we're going to correct that, that problem. Horton Town was down here at the intersection of Babcock Road and Dunham Road, and there was a little school there, and I think it's stomping ground of the Hans among other families. So... So if anything, if you end up shelling out $242 for this book, I would demand a different map because the map is wrong. <coughs> now you know the truth. So where was Pickaville exactly, if that was the general area? And are you guys getting a sense for where we're talking about here for these maps and where they are? This is all northwest Lysander, right? Okay, so it's kind of interesting. As late as 1957, okay, there's a little track that runs off the intersection of Bellows Road and Ellison Road and East Mud Lake Road, about a mile maybe north of Mud Lake, if that's what it's really called. Um, and it, it, it kind of dead ends right there on this creek that runs out of the lake all the way to Ox Creek. Okay, and there was one little house there, and that's the house where the last man to leave Picketville lived, okay? This is Google Maps, and what's really, really cool, I think, I'm easily amused, but 
you know, you can see the trail. This tree line was the trail. And Pickaville was right at the intersection of this trail, this track. And you can see down here, there's the creek. Comes off of Ellison Road, goes all, winds its way around, and it goes up through Little Utica and crosses over and all the way up to Ox Creek um, through Cook's Mill and places like that. So I think it's cool that, that, you know, 100 years later, you can look on Google Maps and you can kind of see the outline of where this actually took place. Why was it there? Um, you know, there, there were drops in elevation all the way along in the creek, and then they, they accentuated that by putting in dams and creating mill ponds and creating, um, you know, a place where you could have water power, and that's why it was there. Seven sawmills between the lake and Cook's Mill on County Line Road, which helped me out. Somebody who's from out in that area, I don't know. We're talking about maybe seven, eight miles, maybe. You know, a lot of mills in a short stretch of road. So... That's where Picketville was. Kind of hard to find. And the interesting thing, um, if you want to try to get there, there's really no easy, you know, it's like you can't get there from here. Um, I would not recommend it any longer. I did go out there myself 10 years ago, but you literally have to walk through the dooryard of a barn and a house. I don't know who owns it now, um, but it's, it's very interesting because this is one of the few shots we have from the, the article in 1933. You can see it's very difficult to see, very grainy. But there's the barn, and that appears to be a milk house, maybe? And there's the barn, and there's the milk house, and that's probably got an ATV or something in it. I'm not really sure. But you can see it went right through here, and that trail that I just showed you started right there at the intersection of Bellows Road and Ellison Road. So you just kind of had to march through somebody's dooryard to get out there. I imagine 100 years ago it wasn't a big deal because everybody knew everybody anyway, right? And you had to get home. So what Elmer said was, ever hear of Picketville? Well, it's on a side road, more of a wagon track than anything else, which runs off another side road, which in turn runs off the Lysander-Phoenix Road in the town of Lysander. So, you know, a very difficult place to find and get to. Um, Tony Christopher said the name Pickaville was given to this little community consisting of a sawmill and a few rustic houses, which is probably being generous. A lane by now obsolete came from East Mud Lake Road and crossed the creek by passing over the dam. So at the time when it was operating, the only way to get across the creek where the houses were was to go over the dam that actually created the water power for the sawmill. So if the dam were in disrepair, got washed out, whatever, you were out of luck. You were stranded on the other side of the creek, and you had to exit east out to Dingle Hole Road, which was a hike. And you had to go through swamps, I know, because I've done it. And it's a, pretty, it's a pretty strenuous journey. Now try doing that um, with no light, okay? Just in the dark, if you had to go out in the dark. This man we're going to talk about traversed this area from all directions, Lampson Road, Dingle Hole Road, Ellison Road, and he did it in the dark, and he did it in the cold in the winter, and it was amazing. So um, we'll talk more about that as well. You know, Pickaville's been forgotten, but I do also take issue in, a distant, in addition to his cartography. I don't really, you know, Elmer and Dick, I would, I would say, was it really ever a village, you know, by any definition of that? You know, you look at the other, um, trivia question, hint, but you look at the other locations here, there's a B and a J and an H that they considered forgotten villages as well. Um, does anybody know what that is? Horton Town. Great, we're off to a great start. Um, J? Jacksonville. B? I feel like I'm back in a rural schoolhouse. This is wonderful. The older kids help out the younger kids, okay? And the P obviously is for Picketville. And you can see these are actual photographs. I did a book and I'm not trying to sell anything. You can only get it at Shacksboro anyway. But I interviewed a lot of people, some of the people in this room, including the, the yeah, very... I just bought one. You just bought it? Yeah, just <laughs> Great. Just one of our classes. Excellent. She didn't know we had I get no uh, remuneration for that, uh, but I it goes to the... It. You yeah. sold it, Sue. Excellent. <laughs> this is wonderful. We're all working together here, the underground economy. Um, there's the Baird's Corner School at the corner of Coppernall and Plainville Lysander Roads. Jacksonville School, and it's kind of interesting picture. They've got some blackboards that tell what date it is, and there's an interesting little white furry thing on someone's oh, lap. 
Okay, well, you know. If you want to give it away, give it away. But, um, and then here's, here's the class at Horton Town from 1911. So these were bona fide places that had more than just a handful of houses. There was a school, there was a church. In the case of Horton Town, not so much. Um, cemetery and school, I don't think much more than that. But Jacksonville, um, certainly store, blacksmith, um, um, cheese factory, cemetery, you name it, exactly. They still have cemetery. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, was Pickaville ever really a village? Did it have any of these things? I, th I think not. So it was forgotten, but maybe not as a village. So that's kind of where Picketville was, Picketville is, so if you want to try to get there. Now, the only thing I would recommend is, uh, you know, I don't know who owns this land now. It's privately owned. It is kind of landlocked out between East Mud Lake Road on the west and Dingle Hole on the east. And you have to do some, some trekking, and, and uh, you, you might want to check with some folks before you go running around back there, especially during deer hunting season. So what was Picketville and, and how did it get there? Um, if it wasn't a village, what was it and how did it get there? So to first understand its provenance, I think we got to learn the history of this place, which everybody knows is, but is it? It's a lake. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of history. I'm writing a book about Beaver Lake, which I hope to have released in time for the 50th anniversary of the park, which is this fall. So I got to get going. So we got to keep this short. I want to be out of here in 15 minutes. So. Yeah, good luck with it, right? Um, so this is a, um, a sunset overlooking Beaver Lake, one of the most special places I think we have in the town, separate and distinct from the fact that there's a nature area there conducted by the, by the county. It's just a beautiful, I know Steve, you go there all the time. It's a wonderful place to walk. Um, so let's go into a little history lesson here. Bonnie, as always, try to restrain yourself. I know you know all the answers to these things. <laughs> so, you know, there's something called the military tract. Who's heard of that? Okay. So at the end of the Revolutionary War, um, and actually before the end, they had promised lands in upstate New York to veterans. Um, and the higher the rank, the more you got. For instance, Marinus Willett, who was a colonel and the first mayor of New York, and really one of Washington's most trusted advisors, got a lot of land. He basically got from Lampson Road on the north all the way down to Cold Springs Road on the south between River Road and the river over on the east side of the town. He got a lot of land. Others didn't get so much um, and they really didn't even want it because at the time you're talking the 1790s, early 1800s, what was, what was this area like back then? Nothing, right? So there, was, there were no farms, nothing had been cleared, it was dense forest. The biggest problem they had was wolves um, and other vermin that you had to be careful about. So it was really you're taking your, your chances to come on up here and who knows, you, you might draw a lot and get up here and there's nothing there, right? There's no place to grow crops. Think about it. Lot 65 in Lysander was the lake. Well, it's great today. I mean, you know, it'd be a wonderful place to develop condos and everything. But in the 1790s, you can't grow a lot on a lake. So, if you drew the lake, you were, kind of, you were kind of out of luck. So a guy named Simon DeWitt was Surveyor General for Washington in the Continental Army, and then for New York State. So he knew a lot about this stuff. And um, there's the military tract for 1792. And what's pretty cool about it, a couple of things. First of all, you know, there, there are some things missing here, like Lysander stretches all the way up to Fulton and the Fish Lake, as they called it, which is the lake I can't pronounce now, Neon. That's why it wasn't a trivia question. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is we got these funky Greek and Latin classical names, right? Like Junius and Cicero and Cato and all these things. Lysander. These were all classical names. And they're still trying to track down the guy who did that because they were like, what were you thinking? Um, it was difficult for folks at the time. So in, in, trip, in typical... Um, uh, nepotic, nepotistic fashion, what did Simon DeWitt do? He assigned the work for the surveying to his cousin Moses DeWitt. Okay, so Moses became surveyor of the Central New York military tract. It was his job to actually create that map. So somebody in the wilderness with no improvements 
and no cleared land had to trek through these forests with very, very primitive surveying tools and try to map out each 600 um, acre lot, which was difficult at the time. But he got it done with the help of a trusted advisor. And that guy's name was Nathan Parshall. Unfortunately, if you look back here, Moses DeWitt, we don't even have a portrait of him, even though he was related to two really important families in the state. He, the DeWitts and the Clintons. He was a nephew of, of, of a Clinton, I think James Clinton, who was um, DeWitt Clinton's father, who was one of the early governors of the state. So this guy was connected on both sides of the family. He died very young and very tragically, but was prominent um, out uh, manliest way. DeWitt and Anlius. So this is probably the coolest thing I've found as a local historian in 20 years. The, I mean, for me at least, I get off on this stuff, but this is a really cool thing. I went to the archives and I was just poking around for Lysander, anything to do with Lysander, because I was trying to find out a little bit more about it. And I found where Moses DeWitt Surveyor Nation Parshall surveyed Lysander Lot 65 on August 26, 1791. I have the actual field book where he, ha he has the bearings and the chains and how far he walked and in what direction and what he encountered, whether he went uphill or downhill, whether it was trees or swamp or whatever. And lo and behold, on Friday, August 26, 1791, and the people at the archive said, you're the first one who ever wanted to look at this. So, <laughs> it's like, um, began to rise gradually, on the rise began to descend, struck a lake. The outlet, north by south, enters a black alder swamp. The lake lies in the south. I don't know the name of this lake. <laughs> Therefore, I leave it to Moses DeWitt to name it. So that's right in the field book. And, and they, they got it down to 225 acres, which is within 5% of the actual acreage of the lake, which is amazing. Now, north is this way, but they got it right, even the shape. And they've got fine birch on the east side, swampy on the west side, fine birch on the south side, swampy up where the outlet and the outlet flowing north. And they were able to crack it. So tonight, for the very first time, you're able to see the first hand-drawn map of the lake, whatever it's called. <laughs> so, what did, uh, so what did Moses DeWitt name this lake? He named it Beaver Lake. So how many guessed Beaver Lake? Bill Weston's the only one who guessed Beaver Lake. So let's just shut down the trivia contest right now. It's Beaver Lake. Now, I hear you. I mean, all the maps after that say Mud Lake, Beaver Lake. Mud, I've got maps that say Mud or Beaver Lake, which is even more infuriating. But the original name of this was Beaver Lake. And if you look really, really closely here, and I'm probably driving Bob Edge at the camera's going like this, but um, you can see Beaver Lake's right there. And this is a map from 1792, hand-drawn, lot 65. What's the name of the outlet? Who can read that? Beaver Creek. So it's not the Mud Lake Outlet. It's not the Beaver Lake Outlet. I've heard Buttonhole or Buttonhook Creek. It's Beaver Creek. So I think we ought to call it that. And then the other thing that's interesting is um, Beecham, back when he wrote his book, Past and Present of Syracuse in 1908, he did say that John McCary, he did settle on the south side, right, on the Van Buren side. But he, he had lands up on the north side uh, before the Baldwins got here. And he planted apple trees about three and one half miles northwest of Baldwinsville on lot 57, which is really the lot that's east and west of Dingle Hole Road. And he called it Beaver Meadow and he harvested grass there because there weren't a lot of places where they could harvest grass to feed the livestock. So that area there, the Dingle Hole Road, is called Beaver Meadow. So we learned a lot, a lot tonight. And you've, you're able to start filling out some trivia questions if you haven't already thrown that piece of paper away. Now, Pickaville eventually ended up right there, but at this time, nobody lived here. Nobody. And it's interesting, I went back and looked and I tried to do as much research as I could on the Haudenosaunee and the indigenous peoples. They were not really interested in Beaver Lake or Beaver Creek. Now, why not? You would think, what a great place, right? Well, it had swamp on two sides of it, okay? And you had the Seneca River just south of it, not even a mile, that was chock full of eels and all kinds of game fish you could want. Ox Creek, as it flowed into the Oswego River to the northwest, 
northeast had all kinds of fish. There was no reason to go to this little lake and spend several hours trying to catch snapping turtles when you could have your, your, your fill of, of fish all up and down the river. So, but very cool map, very real, and we now know the name. Um, you know, so, so all along, whatever, wherever you had changes in elevation, wherever you had water, you had water power. And so the first things that came along typically were grist mills because people had to eat. The second thing were sawmills because people had to live someplace and you had to um, generate lumber and, and other things. So um, this is a great schematic left and right of an actual drawing of what an early sawmill looked like in upstate New York back in the mid 1800s before there actually were circular saws which came around in the 1830s to 1840s. This was called a sash mill. And it literally, as the water tumbled over the water wheel, it, it, it um, generated a turbine and you had this, it's just like a pistons in a car. You had an up and down motion, but literally these were flat saws and they were cutting boards. Very, very rough, but it was very effective. So in the early days of settlement, a sawmill was certain to build on any stream which carried enough water to run a water wheel. An earthen dam thrown up at a feasible spot backed up the flowing creek into a reserve pond. A sawmill would be erected, and as long as the trees lasted, the mill remained in business. Uh, Bob Bitts wrote a great book on manufacturing in Lysander, and he said um, water dropping, power to water wheel, and it was conver converted to the up and down motion of the saw blade. Uh, it made it much faster and provided greater accuracy. Because before that, what were they doing? They were in a pit, two guys with a crosscut saw. Can you imagine? Yeah. So for you guys who are starting the Owasco community, you can either go with the crosscut saw in the pit <laughs> or, or, or the portable sawmill. I know what I'm going to vote for. So that was called a sash mill. Um, another great book that we, you know, look into if you get a chance. He goes into foundries and blacksmiths and everything. Some great, great people who have written about history in the community. I think we're blessed. Um, demand for lumber grew with the population because you had to build buildings, right? Um, and, but there was a guy that really drove the lumber market. So there was a demand for lumber in the area for houses and, and other buildings, commercial buildings and things like that. But there was a guy named James Leslie Voorhees who lived out in the Plainville area, got here very early. Um, I don't know, have you heard of Wig Hill out on West Genesee, Plainville Road, where, where Mark Bitts lived for a while? That was his home. He had it built. Um, beautiful home, and he had, a, he had a private school in it. He also had a, a sawmill down on Peahawk Creek. Who knows where Peahawk Creek is? Boy, that should have been a trivia question. Um, Peahawk Creek flows underneath Gates Road and into the Seneca River just south of Plainville. And again, change in elevation, sawmill. So Voorhees was into it, too. Now, we mentioned Leslie Voorhees, a great local historian in her own right. This was her grandfather, so she knew the guy. And she said in 1810 or soon after, he came to Plainville and settled on a farm, probably only a clearing just north of that little community. The commu country then was almost covered by pine forests, and he soon began buying these lands and lumbering them off. He owned about 3,000 acres, mostly in Lysander. When he was a farmer, he was, he was a farmer, but more, known more particularly as a lumberman. And from his large holdings of pine lands, he was often called the Tall Pine of Lysander. So she wrote that letter back in 1933 to a local paper. Interesting story about Leslie James Voorhees. You know, I think we talked about this the last time. You didn't get where you are to, you were today or back then or whatever by, um, by not being frugal. He was extremely frugal and watched his money very carefully. And there's a story about at the sawmill, um, he was showing off the gold coins that he had come back from New York with because he did float a lot of lumber down the canal all the way down to New York and made a ton of money doing it. So he came back loaded with cash and he wanted to show some of his farmhands how well he had done. Unfortunately, he dropped a gold coin down below uh, the mill into the, who knows, wherever, underneath where, you know, the tall pine was not going to go down there. So he immediately ordered one of his hands to go down there and find the gold coin. The hand got down there and said, I can't find it. Can you drop another one and I'll see where it lands? <laughs> and then I'll bring both of them back up to you. Well, after the third coin, the tall pine <laughs> figured out he was, he was getting flim flammed and said, no more gold for you. So I don't know whether the guy got fired, but he walked away with three gold coins that day. And he was pretty sharp. I think he went into real estate speculation, but I'm not sure. 
So, uh, you know, somebody got the best of him that day. I think he was the kind of guy that did not get bested very often. But anyway, so along with just the general kind of organic need for lumber in Lysander, there was a huge need created by people like Voorhees who were exporting it to places like New York where there wasn't enough of it. Um, and so as a result, you had a lot of sawmills. I told you there were seven up and down this creek. Again, here's a map in 1852, just 50 years, 60 years after the, after the map that Moses DeWitt created. Now, who decided to call it Mud Lake? <laughs> I have no idea. This is the kind of thing that drives historians crazy. Um, but anyway, there was one, you know, there's Church Road, Ellison. At the time, East Mud Lake did not go all the way through the north. You go up a little ways, there's Picketville, and there's that sawmill. Then there's one just south of Little Utica. Uh, and N.C. Dunham was um, the earliest builder of sawmills in this part of the town of Lysander and operated them um, from basically 1825 to almost the end of the century. Another one right in Little Utica, another one northwest of Little Utica, and two more up in the town of Granby, Granby ending with the uh, up Cook's Mill up on County Line Road. So it, it wasn't a very big stream, but all you had to do was, if you had enough water power and, and Beaver Lake constantly fed, it had two inlets, it constantly was feeding water out, you could dam up the, the creek and you could, you could operate a sawmill. That was 1852. Was, but, was Mud Lake, uh, um, did that actually get its name from a muddy bottom, a really muddy bottom? I don't know. I really don't know. Good question for us to investigate. I was wondering next. what type of plant life would grow there yeah. on the bottom. Yeah, it does have a very muddy bottom that I do know. I just don't know the etymology of, of mud. So um, that was 1852. Um, by just seven years later, it was a thriving sawmill. It was the biggest sawmill on the creek, um, including Cook's Mill up north on the county line. And you had a couple of families living there, and you had not just people working in the sawmill, but you had adjacent industries, right? You had adjacent verticals. You had a guy who was a sawmiller, George Snyder, but then there was a lumberman whose job was probably to go out, collect lumber, bring it to the mill on behalf of landowners. And then Joseph Tate was the cooper. So last time I embarrassed myself because I didn't know what a milliner was. I'll never forget that, right? Um, it's somebody who mills corn, right? No, ladies' hats, that's right. Um, what's a cooper? Barrel, barrel. barrel making. Man, you guys are good. I had no idea. I am not in the market for barrels, so therefore I don't know much about coopers. But I just put this picture up there. He's a distant relation. John Spratt uh, was a Picketville neighbor. You can see his... His location was right here, and I was out here yesterday, two days ago, Ellison Road, just north of the creek, and there's a pretty good waterfall there right now without any kind of a dam or anything. It's flowing. Um, so he probably had something going on there. I know he, he operated actually an iron foundry in the village of Lysander later on in life, but at the time he probably was doing some kind of milling on the side on the creek. I think it's interesting to look at how people dressed back then and what they look like and what life must have been like. Um, so we're kind of segueing now into something a little bit bigger. So we're going macro from micro, no longer town of Lysander, but now we're looking more broadly at America and what was going on. In 1876, we had this giant event in Philadelphia, first World's Fair of its kind called the Centennial Exhibition. Anybody ever hear of it? Big deal, big deal. We wanted to celebrate the fact that we had signed the Declaration of Independence 100 years earlier and we were a going concern, and we were doing quite well. Europeans, thank you very much. So what did we do in, in prime nativistic fashion? We invited all these European countries to come, build exhibits, display their wares, and we showed off the latest in technology, in industry, and things like the telephone for the first time. Alexander Graham Bell was there exhibiting his telephone. Um, the typewriter, for the first time, the Remington typewriter was there, and people got to see these things. There was a mechanical calculator. 1876, okay? I don't think it was as good as a smartphone, but it, it probably did the trick. And this was interesting to me. The first taste that the average American got of things like bananas and popcorn were at the Centennial Exhibition. So it wasn't just big things like steam engines and telephones and things like that, but common foods that, that were kind of exotic for American tastes um, at the time. 10 million visitors, okay? I looked it up. The U.S. population at the time was 45 million. Now, 
concentrated on the eastern seaboard because in 76 we still hadn't acquired much of the territory west of the Mississippi. But think about that for a second. Okay, 10 million people, 45 million population, you know, probably one in three adults got to see this thing at some point and were exposed to all this grandeur and all this technology and progress and everything else and what a tremendous impact it had, especially on the banana, banana and popcorn uh, makers in the country. <laughs> It's got to be a first for everything. Yeah. Um, now, this is where it gets a little squirrely, but this I kind of shorthand and put too much in one slide. But anyway, let me explain what also happened. What, what really happened was it was a time of national pride. It was a revival of the colonial ideal in that a lot of what was displayed what was how great things were in the colonies back 100 years prior. You know, I'm not so sure how great things were in the colonies. We were at war, people were poor, um, and, and a lot of bad things were happening. But they were glorifying the colonies to the degree that, that um, things like anything that had to do with colonial decorations, colonial crafts. Um, they had um, uh, an exhibit where what a typical colonial housewife would have had in her kitchen in her dining room. It would have been a spinning wheel and all kinds of things like this. So people got, had a renewed interest in the colonial revival. And they said here, I just picked two exhibits, one exhibit depicted differently, near the summit of the hill on the southern side of this valley and snugly nestled against the tall trees, which are now in freshness of renewed life, is a quaint structure of that style of architecture which characterized the backwoodsman cot in Vermont or Connecticut 100 years ago. It's called the New England Log Cabin. In connection with it, right next to it, is a building of familiar architecture called the New England Modern Kitchen. They, taken together, they are designed to exhibit a comparison between the manner of carrying on culinary operations and attending table a century ago, and that of doing the same things at present in the eastern states. A combination of quaint architecture, antiquated furniture, and the epical costumes of the attendants gives one a pleasing view of life in New England a century ago. What do you think the most popular exhibit was at the Centennial Exhibition? Was it Alexander Graham Bell's telephone? Was it Remington's typewriter? Was it the bananas and the popcorn? It was this. People were enthralled by this because this was something they could copy at home in their everyday life. And they wanted to model colonial America. Because remember, what was going on at this time? The Industrial Revolution was threatening an agrarian economy. People were very nervous about jobs being taken away. Um, and jobs changing, and the nature of the country changing from an agrarian one to an industrial one caused a lot of angst and a lot of um, concern in America. The second thing was we did have a lot of nativism going on. This was the height of immigration. So you had a lot of Eastern Europeans and people from other countries coming, and the people said, well, I've been here since the Mayflower, and uh, I want things a little bit better. So maybe it sounds a little familiar to what's going on today. I'm not really sure. But been here first, not in my backyard, that kind of thing. But what's interesting is the other thing that happened at this time was the whole genealogy craze took off. I didn't bring the book because it was too big, but people started, the wealthy and the people with time in their hands, started producing family genealogies. I have a book at home that's this thick on the foster genealogy written in the 1890s by some guy. Can you imagine I mean, today it would have taken months to put this thing together, even with the internet, Ancestry.com, everything else we've talked about. This guy went out and wrote letters to all his cousins and cousins' cousins and put together these elaborate family trees and published it in book form. So a lot of people were really going back to their roots, and many of them were trying to prove a connection back to the Mayflower so they could say, we were here first, right? <laughs> but what do you notice in this photo? Um, well, it's kind of a leading question. What do you see in this photo that maybe, maybe doesn't seem so strange, but it's kind of glaring? Picket fence. Picket fence. Who said that? Is that Bill? Excellent, Bill. Picket fence. So back in colonial days, there were picket fences. Picket fences went away. People saw this, and they thought it was so quaint and so cool, picket fences took off like crazy. So. Maybe I can't completely redo my house or my kitchen, but I can put a picket fence around the outside of my yard, fence in my yard, garden a little bit, and I'm gonna be looking like I really know what's going on. Um, and sure enough, 
If you look at photos of the time, I don't care whether it's in Baldwinsville or other places, but even out in the rural outreaches of Northwest Lysander in places like the hamlet of Lysander, Plainville, um, people put up picket fences around their homes and they started manicuring their yards. Now these weren't the people out in the true country that had big farms and croplands and livestock. These were the people inside the hamlet that were doctors and school teachers and merchants and things like that. But they all put up picket fences and posed with them with their extended family. So Tony says, Christopher, a white picket fence around the lawn or yard in previous times gave a stylish appearance to the premises. Old pictures of Baldwin's will show just about every house enclosed with a slat or picket fence. Another lady said picket fences were all the rage. There were picket fences and thickly planted lawns. So the whole movement to go from what was a lawn was basically an extension of the street. Um, it was open to dogs, cats, livestock, kids, whatever. It really wasn't considered private property so much. Now it became an enclosure around your house and it was private area. Now what's interesting is you get out way out in the country and you look at two of my distant relations who were dirt poor. <laughs> no picket fence, right? Now two things. They were way out in the country and it just it wasn't practical or affordable to have a picket fence when you've got livestock in the field, right? It's a picket fence isn't gonna stop an ox. If he wants to get in your yard, he's gonna get in your yard, right? A, a slat rail uh, or split rail fence is gonna do the trick. So here you see the Thomas Kelly family on the corner of Fenner and West Lake Road, which is now Reeves Road, just west of Beaver Lake. And then you see the Albert Foster family over on Plainville Lysander Road near the intersection of one of my favorite named roads, which is Dog Harbor Road, which if anybody knows how it got that name, I'd like to know. Um, what's interesting about this house is you can see um, things were kind of going to seed there. She, she, so... Uh, her, one of her biggest chores in the winter was to go up in the upstairs where her son slept and shovel it out so that they could come up and sleep at night um, because the roof was completely gone. So we think we have it tough today when it snows. You don't have to shovel out your upstairs. You can go to bed. No picket fences for them. <laughs> Getting snow out of the attic was the priority. It's interesting. I, I started looking into this a little bit more, and of course... America's the land of opportunity and shameless self-promotion, as we all know. So as picket fences became more and more popular, but again, for village residents in places like Baldwinsville and for some of these isolated rural hamlets, but inside the hamlet where you were a merchant or a doctor or whatever you were, uh, enterprising people started creating atlases, okay? And so in the atlas were maps of the area, histories of the area, but also they would have... Um, you could pay, if you paid enough to sponsor the atlas, you could have your photograph or that of your family or that of your farm inside the atlas for a price. And uh, you can see on the left here, there's canvassing a farmer for an atlas. And then on the right, this is where they set it up. And the artist is saying, he's making a picture to suit the imagination. So there's the farm. And he's saying, the farmer's saying, now put an old woman and children down to life. So... <laughs> photoshopping a hundred years ago. So when it gets in the atlas, it doesn't look like we're dirt poor farmers, but we, got, we know what we're doing. So what happened? Uh, and this is from a book, which I love this title. I gotta find it somewhere. It's, it's digitally available. How Tis Done, a thorough ventilation of the numerous schemes conducted by wandering canvassers, together with the various advertising dodges for the swindling of the public. <laughs> There was no ax to grind there. <laughs> so they were doing other things too. They were selling other things to farmers that farmers didn't need to buy. And they were preying on people that maybe were a little less educated and a little less worldly. And this was one way they did it with these atlases. Two people that fell for the scheme were right in Northwest Lysander. Pretty well-known names. Um, Frederick W. Fenner, I mean Fenner Road's name for the Fenner family, and they were littered up and down Fenner Road. There were many of them, prodigious people that had lots of sons. Um, their, their farm isn't that far from what is now Reeves Road. It's actually on the 
east side of Fenner Road between Reeves and Church Road. And it's still there. Um, the Electa Van Devere Farm um, over on Swamp Road near Avery Road. So I know there's folks here that are very familiar with that area, and that farm is still there. But what I noticed about this, and which completely defies logic and the imagination, is what do we see around these farms? <laughs> Picket fences, okay? They did not exist. We've been able to go back and verify there were no picket fences. There were split rail fences to keep the livestock out of the road and away from the house, but there were not picket fences. I mean, think about the cost and the feasibility of trying to surround a several acre property with picket fence and to what end? It didn't make any sense. You weren't gonna keep anybody out or anybody in and they weren't doing any plantings. So this is actually a manifestation of the previous slide. Somebody came along, sold these folks a bill of goods and said, you can sponsor the Atlas and you'll get a full page with you and your wife and your beautiful farm and we'll make it look exactly like you want it to look. Now, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the Fenner or Vandeveer's families, but I doubt it looked like that in the day. Certainly not a picket fence. Here's what they look like today. I mean, things were well built, so if you wanna go check out where these places are, these, these photos are about 10 years old, but the, the barn, the, the Vandeveer barn is still in good standing. It looks exactly like it did before. Um, both houses are in decent shape. So they withstood the test of time, but I don't see any picket fences. Anyway, so what does that got to do with Picketville? Well, picket fences were all the rage and everybody wanted them. And so by 1878, the popularity of picket fences had peaked and at some point, you know, somebody decided, you know, we can just make lumber, we can make barrels, we can make slabs, whatever we're going to do for houses, or we can make pickets because there was such a high demand for them. And people didn't tend to get them from other places, they bought them locally. So these guys decided to provide all of Northwest Lysander with their pickets for all these picket fences, and they were doing really, really well. Bill Brown came in and ran the sawmill. I was able to find a picture of him, find a picture of him on. Uh, an ancestry, that's him right there. Other families there were the Tottenhams, the Tates, the Brushes. Again, at the time, not really a village, a sawmill and a handful of houses, and they had some farmland, that was about it. No real road, no school, no store. So it really just was, was a community built around a single industry and a single operation. He would eventually marry the widowed Mrs. Brush. Her husband worked on the canal, which at the time was not a very safe job, and he drowned. Uh, in the Erie Canal, and so Bill Brown married Mrs. Brush and adopted her children, including her youngest son, John Brush, um, and they all ended up working in the mill for some time. Now, that was Picketville, and how did it get there? Any questions, trivia or otherwise? No, okay. Carol Kay, have anything to contribute at this point? Not yet, okay. So when and how did it disappear? Um, you know, Americans love trends, and so as fast as the picket fence craze came about, then there became, uh, then there was an anti-fence campaign, an anti-fence movement in America. <laughs> so the aesthetics in America, including people like Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, decided enough with the picket fences, enough with the fences, period. They're providing a separation between the home and the community. It's an artificial barrier in it you can't see any of the vegetation or gardening that takes place do we really need these fences and i got a real kick out of this because they were <laughs> they were really on their high horse up here a fence is just an inducement to mischief and mischief so if you put up a fence little kids are going to see it as an opportunity to create problems the school is better than the fence so instead of relying on a fence just let the teacher tell you you're not supposed to trespass <laughs> And then down here, they actually tell you which types of areas are best fenced in and which are left untouched. Where a fence is needed, livestock, split rail fence, but crops are safe without a fence. The corners and roadsides are mo made most useful by the plow. And you can see over here, they've got a fence and the livestock's getting into it anyway, so there's really no way to keep them out as much as to keep them in. And then you got this beautiful home over here and there's no fence around it, so you can see it. Up here, I like this, the fence. Fence or no fence? That's the question on which we here present the opinions of men, great and wise and witty. So in 1889, I don't know, I mean, maybe there wasn't a lot going on, but if the fences were the biggest issues we had to deal with, I, 
<laughs> you know, I'm sure there was a war going on somewhere. <laughs> and people were, you know, there was poverty and everything else. But fences, we got to take care of that first. The verdict is in favor of fences were actually needed for their total and instant destruction where they are useless and expensive, and expensive blot upon the face of nature and art. Those are incendiary words. Basically, they're, they're saying if you don't like it, go down and rip down the fences. And if you really wanted to get involved, you know, like on Facebook today, you could actually sign the New Fence Creed, <laughs> which, as the crusade called this 19th century, is down with fences, barriers, limitations. So the American Gardens crusade against useless fences in villages and towns seems to in line with the spirit of the times, and we heartily endorse the movement. So if you wanted to get really involved, <laughs> an early attempt at a pack, I think, of some kind. But, and then they show you what's the worst case scenario. Fenced in versus released from bondage. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't too long after the abolition that this took place, but I, would, I don't think bondage was kind of an extreme term to use for fencing and not. And I've never seen a picket fence that's eight feet tall either. So <laughs> anyway, I just got a kick out of that. I thought, but there definitely was a movement in America that said down with fences, especially picket fences. Now, so that was one thing I think that you know, if you're in Picketville making pickets and all of a sudden there's this giant movement to say no more picket fences, you're going, hmm, we're kind of a one-trick pony. This is what we do. Uh, we got worries. Closer to home, they had bigger worries. So we've talked about James Upson. He's there on the left. He was one of the most prominent citizens we ever had in this town. He owned three of the four corners in the village of Baldensville, all three Seneca hotels he built because the first two burned. And so he was a, he was a mover and shaker. He became an assemblyman in the state. <laughs> And he introduced a bill back in 1889 to provide for the clearing out of the obstructions in the outlet of Beaver or Mud Lake in the town of Lysander, blah, 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 and draining certain low lands adjacent thereon. Now, why would he want to do something like that? I mean, you've got all these mills up and down the creek. They're already facing economic hardship and financial ruin. Why would Mr. Upson, a fine, upstanding man and politician, want to do that? Well, he also was the largest tobacco land-owning baron in the town of Lysander and was constantly looking for new places to plant. He had tobacco lands in Lysander, and more important, many of his political constituents had tobacco land. And in and around the area of Beaver Creek um, was prime real estate, and they thought that if they could drain the land and get rid of the mills, um, which tended to back up the water and flood the swamps, then they'd have more land to plant tobacco. The bill did not pass. But anyway, that was another, I think, a sale on, the, uh, on Picketville. Um, you know, but we talked about the campaign against fences, the anti-fence movement. We talked about people kind of surreptitiously trying to drain the creek and the effect that had on, on Picketville and other sawmills. The real issue, though, was, is really more simple, and it, it comes down to demographics. And that is that, you know, Picketville was not a village. I wouldn't even consider it a hamlet because you had hamlets like Little Utica, which was just up the road half a mile, you know, within walking distance. Had its own church and school. Um, there's a good shot of the church. The school, you can just barely see the corner of it there. Um, here's a class from 1922. Um, I have names. I think you guys gave me names. Yeah, your dad's in there somewhere. Yep. Um, and here's how they look. Talk about well-preserved buildings. I mean, this is probably, you know, these are disappearing very, very rapidly. Most of them are private residences. They're burning um, or being removed, as in the case of Plainville. But the Little Utica folks, I think, have done a stellar job of refurbishing that schoolhouse. And you can walk in, and it looks just like it did uh, hundreds of years ago. Well, a couple hundred years ago. And you guys have some kind of rummage sale or something there on a regular basis? Yeah? To raise money for it? Okay. So anyway, we might want to think about patronizing that as well. So that, I consider Little Utica was really a hamlet. Okay? In addition to the church and the school, there was a store. Okay? There were more than one store. There's a blacksmith, a cheese factory. So there's a lot more going on than just a sawmill in Picketville. The other thing they had going on, which was a hopping place, was the Lysander Hotel. Now, de <laughs> depending on the generation you come from, um, it was hopping more than, <laughs> than other times. Um, 
It's interesting. You go back to 1860, and it doesn't look like it could handle it, but 3,000 people descended on the village hamlet of Little Utica. I don't know where you put people, 3,000 people, in Little Utica. They must have been lined up in the street somewhere, but there was a Republican rally for Lincoln, and they called it a jollification. And they were able to get 500 people into the first floor, and I imagine drink was served uh, at some point, and things were getting pretty rowdy, and lo and behold, the floor dropped out, and they all fell into the basement. <laughs> 500 people falling into the basement of the hotel. Now, either they were all so drunk it didn't bother them, but nobody got hurt. <laughs> it was like, you know, everybody lived, nobody was hurt, and everything went on. And I think the Little Utica Hotel got even wilder after that, 100 years later. I'm pretty sure my dad, at the age of 16, I recall him saying that when he was in high school, he was in a little jazz band kind of thing, and they played at the Little Utica Hotel. And my dad was very small and not a fighter and not a drinker. And so he would say we'd play usually until we had to leave. And I go, well, what do you mean, like 11 midnight? He goes, no, until the first fight broke out. And then we had to go. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, it was a hop in place for a hundred years. It was, things were going on there. And I'm sure there are people that could tell a lot more stories about the Little Utica Hotel because it preceded me. Unfortunately, there it is on the right. I took it in 2009. It's completely gone now. If you go to that corner, it's just an empty lot, which is kind of a shame because it was a historic building. Um, now, the, the other thing, I, another book I'm working on is kind of Lysander, Town of Granby area murders. There have been a lot of... Um, very sensational murders and tragedies have taken place in the area. And one took place at the Little Utica Hotel in 1889. And a guy got stabbed coming out of there. Um, so uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's got a storied past, and I think there are a lot of stories still left to be told. Do you guys have any stories about Little Utica Hotel? I'm sure you weren't allowed in there, right? I think we went in once. <laughs> Good answer, Kay. I'm sticking with it. Um, Jacksonville. So, so Little Utica was just half, three-quarters of a mile north. Jacksonville, another mile and a half northwest. Um, you had the school and the Baptist church in 18, circa 1880, but that dates to, I think, 1822, Bonnie, if I'm not mistaken. One of the earliest churches in the town of Lysander. Um, and there's the Jacksonville Rural, Jacksonville Rural School Class of 1898. Um, earliest photo we have of that school. Uh, doesn't look much different now. You know, it's a residence on the corner of Fenner Road and Lampson Road. Interestingly enough, these two sat next to each other when the state straightened Lampson Road in the mid-60s, I want to say. They separated the two. So now you've got the school on one side of Lampson Road and the Grange Hall on the other side, another very well-preserved building that's worth a look. You go inside that building, I want to say that building's been around 200 years about the Grange Hall. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's the Baptist Church. That's the Baptist Church. Right, yes. yeah. So that became that. Yes. Yeah, so it's a 200-year-old building right here. So, again, you know, there's some places you can go and, and, and actually look and see how these things are constructed and imagine what life might have been like. My mother, my grandmother taught at Jacksonville for a number of years, I think, not in 1898. Yeah. Was it an operating church right up until when it was moved? And it, did it become a Grange Hall right after the move? No, it became a Grange Hall earlier because the Baptist church merged, I think, with another church. Yeah. And, yeah. Right? Am I wrong? I think so. Yeah, yeah. And then the, I mean, it was a Grange Hall when it was moved. Mm -hmm. They were having pancake breakfast there? They oh, yeah. still do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in 10 years, but they're, they're, they're to die for. All, the, all you can eat. Wonderful. Great places out in Northwest Lysander. Uh, another place that I think qualifies, maybe not as much as Little Utica or Jacksonville, was Lampson. Um, the train stopped. You know, the train, the, the DL and W train came from Oswego through Lampson. So there was a depot there. There was a hotel there. There was a store there. And there was a stage that went back and forth between Lampson and Phoenix. And I was like, a stage? You mean like a stage coach? Yeah, that's it right there. There was a stagecoach. I associate those with like the Wells Fargo stage out west or whatever. But we had a stagecoach that went back and forth from Phoenix to Lampson every day to ferry people back and forth between the train station and Phoenix, which is kind of cool. So all these places, I think, kind of qualify and justify as hamlets. They had commerce. 
they had transportation, they were on major thoroughfares, in most cases they were on uh, intersections of roads. Pickettville didn't fit the bill in any of those cases. So that's really what I think did the place in. Um, and sure enough, by the turn of the century, it was on its way to a literal dead end. I mean, Pickettville was always a dead end. There was no place to go. You cross that natural bridge over the creek, there's a couple of houses, there was a sawmill, and then where do you go from there, right? You got woods all the way to Dingle Hole Road on the right. So this is East Mud Lake Road. Again, Ellison, Bellows, this track, it never even really had a name, and then Dingle Hole Road's over here, okay? So there was a lack of demand for lumber um, because population had plateaued, things had been built, and let's face it, you could make lumber cheaper in other places because they were doing it in volume in places like Baldwinsville and beyond. But this William Brown guy I showed you, he, he had his mill in order again, but now look what had happened. So by 1891, he was no longer had a sawmill, now he converted it to a grist mill. That kind of tells me something, that there wasn't lumber to be milled anymore, and he was switching to something that he think he could handle, which was grist. But you notice he's soliciting patronage, which is another way of saying, please come use me. There was seasonal flooding of the creek. Um, the dam on his pond gave way, flooding into the lowlands, and that happened on a regular basis. There were seven of these mills from, says mud, it's wrong, Beaver Lake all the way up the creek, and they flooded on a constant basis because Mud Lake had, or Beaver Lake had a different levels of water flowing into it and it fed the creek and it would flood, which is why I think James Upson back in 1889 wanted to drain the lands, clear out all the mills, and make sure the water would flow through so there wasn't as much flooding. And then lastly, the opposite of flooding, you had, it was susceptible to drought. There was a time back in 1915 when they said, the brooks and swamps are dry and dusty. The outlet of Mud Lake is dry. If you've, I've been by that at different points in its, in its course, and I've seen it full all the time. I've never really seen it bone dry. So that must have been devastating if you're running a mill and there's no water. What do you do? It's not like you're going to turn on the electricity. So, um, you know, by 1934, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but there's not a lot of information. This is literally the only known photograph we have of Pickettville. This is uh, one house with a barn next to it. It's the Brush House. And if you remember, there was a guy named Bill Brown, and he adopted the Brush kids, and John was one of those who worked at the mill. He was the only person left in Pickettville. He, at this point, had no way to earn a living. Sawmills closed down. It's not even a grist mill, and there's really nothing there. He's, he's isolated from the rest of the world. There's no road in or out. There's no water. There's no electricity. Now, in the 30s, that wasn't totally uncommon. You got electricity at the farm when? 41, I think you said? Something like that. So it wasn't totally rare, but it still made life a little bit more difficult. The Post Standard reported in 33, there are only two houses left. The mill's gone, the other houses are gone, and the stream was dry last week. Things aren't looking good. Um, and then said, will indeed be a forgotten village as the house occupied by the Fred Powers family burned on Monday morning. Now there's only one house left. So. In the early 30s, you had two. You had the Powers and the Brushes. One burned. The Powers moved to, I think, Lafayette or someplace out there. Um, and now you've got one guy in a house, isolated, with no way in or out, no water, no electricity, and no way to make a living. Difficult situation. Um, <laughs> I put this up here. I don't know why. So, you know, we're fickle, right? Things come and go. Well, interest resurged again in picket fences, but they were mass produced. They made a comeback post-war because the GIs were coming back from the war and they wanted, you know, the house with the picket fence and the wife and the kids and suburbs. And so picket fences became all the rage to the degree that a picket fence actually factored importantly in It's a Wonderful Life in 1946. It was a big deal. If you remember, George Bailey was walking along with the, all kinds of shenanigans happened at the picket fence. So in the 40s, it became synonymous with the American dream. Um, you know, a little too late, a little too little to help Picketville. Um, these are mass produced, they're in the big cities. It's really meant to fuel the boost, the, the, the burgeoning suburban market in metro areas, not places like Picketville or Lysander. Um, and so for the next 30 years, he lived alone as a hermit without electricity or running water. Um, and so now we're getting into the 60s, and um, he's not a kid anymore. He was born in 1883. 
so he was at this point pushing 80, right? Yep, that's him. Now, John was an unusual character, whether it was due to the isolation or he was always like that. He, he, he made a very good hermit um, because he did some unusual things. I've got some quotes here from some people who knew him. And they said, no matter the weather, hot or cold, he always wore the same thing. He'd wear a long, dark wool coat that went down at least to his knees, and he wore long, lace-up boots. And he walked wherever he went. Um, kids were told that John had a shotgun, and he didn't go messing around down there. So. <laughs> Which I think was good advice. I heard that the reason he wore the boots and the coat from more than one person was John was deathly afraid of snakes. Now, we don't have poisonous snakes, but we got a lot of black and water snakes in the area. He just didn't like them. And so one of the things he did, he carried a scythe, right, a hand scythe, and he would, um, he would cut grass, a grass path, all the way out to Ellison Road and all the way out to Dingle Hole Road so he'd have two means of getting out if he needed to in the, in the right kinds of weather. Now, forget about the shotgun. If you're like a five- or six-year-old kid and you see this guy coming along with a scythe <laughs> through a field... And you've never seen one before because it's 1965. I'd give him a clear berth. Um, the, the farm on the right was a, was a lady named uh, Eva Young Maxim, and I, I interviewed her for a school story as well. That barn, unfortunately, is gone. But she talks about she lived there her entire life from 3 to 80-something on Dingle Hole Road and said, oh, yeah, I saw John come out of the woods all the time. Very friendly, very nice, but, you know, a little bit, little bit odd and kept to himself. Uh, unfortunately, when the blizzard of 66 came along, John, you know, reached some dire straits. And one person I talked to said that when it got cold, you know, I think we're all old enough to remember the blizzard of 66, except you guys. And it was awful. And so you can imagine how difficult it was living in our heated homes um, with electricity and running water. But for John, Ver John Brush, who was in a isolated place with no running water, no electricity. Um, you know, unfortunately, a guy I talked to said my dad went back to check on John, and John was stripping the house of the wallboard um, and the floorboards and burning them to stay warm. So at that point, the, the end was, was not far away. Um, so sadly, Pickettville lost both its last man and its last home in 1967. Again, the only picture we have of, of John Brush uh, and the only picture that we have of his house and barn. We lost both in the same year. He reached a point where he could no longer care for himself. He fell and broke his collarbone and had to go into the county home, uh, which is now part of Onondaga Community College and a, a natural historic place. Um, and then later on, uh, the fire department was called out later that year because the house burned down for whatever reason. I, I so, think the kids set fire to it. Yeah. highly likely. So, probably to make up for the shotgun, right? So he never married. He didn't have family. No. no. Mm -hmm. He used to do farm work. Yeah. He get hired out for food and so. Right. So he 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 was a you know day laborer. He would come and work on your farm or whatever. Now he did have. I heard he had good carpentry skills. Uh, and he was a hard worker. Oh, he was. Yeah. Um, but I also heard he made frequent visits to the Lysander Hotel. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think it was to hear my dad play the clarinet for some reason. Uh, but you know, it was his money. So, um, you know, so we're going to fast forward ahead. What's left there? Again, I want to discourage you from visiting unless and until you check to find out whose land it is and whether they have a shotgun um, and whether they're open to people visiting. But back in 1969. Uh, Tony Christopher went out. He was able to find the remnants of the John Brush well at his house. I went in 2009 and found the same thing, but you can see the difference. You know, nature is taking its course. <coughs> um, Tony found the foundation of the house, but by the time I got there, that same foundation had decayed to the point where you can't even really see it anymore. So again, if you go out there, I don't know what you're going to see, but you may still be able to see some remnants. And I think it's kind of cool because Unlike these other lost villages that maybe they're lost, but people still live in Little Utica. People still live in Jacksonville. They still live in Lysander Hamlet and Baird's Corners and Hortontown and places like that. There may not be a lot of them. There may not be stores or churches or schools, but there's a community. This place is truly, I think, unique in Onondaga County in that 
there was a thriving enterprise there and a community around it, and it's gone. So it's a, it's kind of a, a mystery, I think, in a mysterious place. Daffodils, though. When we went back in. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Daffodils were forever. <laughs> yeah, they were still there. So here's the, uh, here's the dam. Now, we've got two guys down there on the dam. That's Glenn and Ken Blakeman. Anybody remember the Blakemans? Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, yeah, so Ken, uh, Glenn Blakeman was Cecil Reeves' uncle. Um, and so Cecil and Glenn spent a lot of time on the creek um, trying to rectify <laughs> flooding situations and things like that. Um, and then in the right, that's what I was able to find in 2009, same exact spot. It's really hard to tell anything was there. But remember, you know, when John Brush lived there, that was his only means across the creek. At one time, it was wide enough for a horse and buggy, they said. By the time John was in his 80s and it was 60-whatever, people said he had to cross that log over the creek in the middle of the night. Now, you're tens of miles from any light, any natural light, so goodness knows how he got in and out of that place without getting hurt. Probably broke his collarbone that way. Um, and then... Christopher doesn't have a picture of it, but I was actually able to find the mill spillway. Remember, I showed you the schematic. Every pond for a sawmill had to have a spillway for overflow. So this is where the water went to run the mill, but you had to have um, a spillway for excess water when you had overflows. And that's still, that's, you could still see it there. So it's kind of interesting. I think if you went back there today, you'd be able to find some remnants of this place, the dam, the house, the well the spillway, other things like that. Now, you may find even more if you're enterprising and lucky enough, because this guy, uh, circa 2000, went back there and found actually some, some artifacts, some household goods. What's his name? It's a trivia question. I can't answer that. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm related by marriage to some folks that had visited Pickettville like I did, but earlier. And there are piles of artifacts and I mean some of these are ancient you're talking about hundred year old lamps and things like that so this guy was back there um, I'm pretty sure he was arrested but I'm not positive so <laughs> so you're gonna have to ask around to find out who this is he's a really cool guy um, Pickettville is, is, is long gone but I did run around this weekend and said what can I see you can still see um, not Pickettville necessarily, but why Pickettville ended up where it did and what it did. It's a beautiful part of the town, let's face it. This is um, Beaver Creek, because I'm going to call it that. I'm not going to call it the Mud Lake Outlet. Flowing east out of East Mud R Lake Road, um, heading east toward Ellison Road. And there it is, Beaver Creek flowing northeast out of Ellison Road, heading toward Pickettville. Beautiful bucolic setting. Probably know some of the people that own these properties. Um, the one sawmill that's left, and I have not gotten up the gumption to talk to the folks that own the place, is Cook's Mill. Cook's Mill was the last operating sawmill on Beaver Creek. It was, at that point, the biggest. And this mill pond right here also functioned as an ice harvesting location. So, you know, back in the day, they would go out in the winter and they would cut ice either mechanically or with cross-cut saws, and they'd haul it with teams of horses to a place to store it. They put it over, put sawdust, layers of sawdust over it and keep it for the spring and summer. So Cook's Mill served two purposes. It was a functioning sawmill as late as the 60s. They, you actually could take lumber there to be, to be cut, trees there to be cut rather. And then this is Beaver Creek on the other side of County Line Road heading north toward Ox Creek away from Cook's Mill. So those were just shot two days ago. Um, beautiful location. If you want to go see what it looked like, what a sawmill might have looked like, and what a mill pond looked like. It's right there. You know, but I guess my point is there was a point where after I wrote the article, I was feeling a little down, and I got my dog, and I went out the lane to Pickettville, and I sat there, and I looked around, and this is a gorgeous, gorgeous place. So there may not be remnants of the sawmill anymore or the homes, but it's absolutely stunning. So I, I would think that, you know, I'd trade every picket fence in America for Beaver Creek around Picketville. And who knows, maybe if we get lucky, we already have Beaver Lake, 
but maybe there's room for another wildlife area or natural area. Can you imagine having a natural trail that walks down along the side of this creek? It's full of fish, it's clean, it's bucolic, the birds are chirping, and as long as you don't get shot, it's a wonderful place to be. <laughs> So um, that's really all I have on Picketville, but I wanted to see how you guys did on your trivia questions. So do we want to go through those really quick? Do we have time? We do? Anyway, um, other, other comments or questions about Picketville? Again, this was a little different from the last two we did. They were very biographical. This is more about a place, not a person. And it's very mysterious, but um, kind of a cool place. So any other questions? I appreciate everybody coming.